everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming out to this panel today. We'll briefly introduce ourselves, but we're all primarily here to discuss AI in India today and the ways in which you know, advanced technology is not only disrupting the way students learn, but also the way employees are being managed in the country. So I'm Karina Jangyani. I'm one of the investment associates out of the GSV Acceleration San Francisco office. So I work for Deborah's team and really thank all of you for being here today and hope you guys have had a great time at the summit thus far. Uh, my name is Neil Shinoy. I'm a founding partner of a company in New York called 212 Media. Uh, and one of the portfolio companies within 212 Media is an early learning education company called Begin, uh, where I serve as CEO and co-founder. And um, I'm happy to say that <laughs> Uh, Deborah and Krina and GSV Acceleration are investors and have been phenomenal supporters of our business and our mission behind uh, early childhood for many years now. I'm Harman Singh. I'm the founder and CEO of WizIQ.com. It's a uh, cloud-based um, software platform for anybody to build their own online academy and teach uh, uh, in either self-paced learning manner or uh, instructor-led live online learning. Hi. Hi, I'm Himanshu. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Aspiring Minds, um, a company involved in uh, doing efficient job matching using technology, AI, and, and machine learning to an extent, but using assessments, video interviewing, and so on to do automated job matching, helping both students, job seekers, as well as corporations do that better. <coughs> and, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, I'd love to open up with you know news that hit the pages earlier this week with Imbibe, led by Aditi, who was actually supposed to be on this panel today, but cannot for good reason. So Reliance invested you know 180 million in Imbibe, owning about 73% of the company. Imbibe is now one of the largest AI education platforms in the country, really looking at using AI not only to study the ways in which students you know, interact with the test, whether it's response times, whether it's the amount of times they change their answers to the question, overall confidence building, but also really looking to kind of disrupt the test prep in industry altogether. And Neil, I know with your previous company, Savan, you had your deal with Reliance as well, which I'll let you kind of discuss with the audience, but would love to start and get your thoughts on what do you think the imbibe transaction means for AI in India today? And if you can kind of relay your experiences with Savan as well as some of the trends that you've noticed within AI in India, that'd be great. Sure. Um, so I think the imbibe transaction is, is interesting for a few um, disparate themes. I think starting with just corporate transactions, and we were just remarking that uh, it's nice to see Reliance, which obviously is India's largest business, uh, largest conglomerate, um, being more aggressive about both investments and acquisitions of uh, upstart companies. Um, you know, it was a, a bit of a surprise to us, even though we are partnered with Reliance. They acquired our, our music service a few weeks ago in a, in a billion dollar transaction uh, that they were actually investing heavily in ed tech. Um, so I think that from a corporate perspective of putting India on the map and having a significant player um, is exceptional and I think something to be celebrated uh, by Aditi and the team. Um, I think the second is that um, I think it starts to frame the importance of, of AI and investments in AI in India. I mean, we'll, we'll spend a lot of time talking today about uh, what the uh, criticality of AI is and how it can serve the Indian marketplace, but this is almost like putting a flag in the ground and suggesting that there has to be heavier investments in AI, mm -hmm. and both based on what they paid for the transaction and the commitment that they've made to invest $180 million, I think it shows uh, what the <laughs> importance of that will be to the broader landscape. The way that we tend to think about AI uh, in India is that in, in the US markets, when we think of artificial intelligence, we tend to think of uh, applied consumer use cases for AI. So we think of self-driving cars, and we think of, of uh, Google Home and natural language. And I think what's more interesting initially in India is what role that AI can play foundationally in easing some of the consumer and infrastructure challenges. And so I'll, I'll start with a simple example relating to Savan. So we are the largest music streaming service in India. Now combined with Reliance, we have 50 million consumers on that platform. We have uh, a large music catalog, you know, tens of millions of tracks. Uh, and yet we are confined by um, the smartphones that consumers use and we're confined by accessibility and cost of data. And so for us to overcome the hardware issues and the bandwidth issues, artificial intelligence that can effectively learn your music habits and more intelligently serve up content and playlists is critical from a use case perspective um, for us to be successful. 
So we think of AI as a, of something that alleviates some of the foundational issues and infrastructure issues that India is in the process of overcoming. Um, and that is what's most exciting to me about the application of AI to the broader sort of ed tech community, which obviously we'll, we'll dig into a little bit more today. Yeah. And it's interesting because clearly, as you mentioned, AI can help with kind of laying out the infrastructure needed for companies to then accelerate their growth and really leverage their true capabilities. But Harman, I'd love to ask you, you know, Neil already mentioned some of the key issues within the country today. To what extent has AI already arrived in India? Yeah, so this is a question I've been dwelling with ever since you asked it. I have yet to see a real application of AI uh, working uh, you know, in a business model and really solving a key problem uh, in India yet. So I haven't seen it. Maybe, you know, uh, maybe it's hidden somewhere. Or I don't know about it, but I haven't seen it. Now, having said that, uh, is there, is there going to be a lot of AI moving forward? Of course there is. AI does solve, uh, at least uh, theoretically right now, solve a lot of problems. And practically, we have seen the West solve the self-driving car problem, natural language processing problem. Uh, using that, Echo has done some great stuff and so on. So, uh, so all the use cases that really make sense so far have been seen in the West, but not in India yet. Having said that, I think there's a lot to happen. I do know a lot of startups uh, uh, trying to solve a lot of problems using AI. But here's the other thing. We have this panel on AI. Uh, but I like, to, uh, I, I like to think like uh, what Peter Thiel says. It's, about, it's not about AI or SaaS or cloud or mobile. Historically, the problems are the same, mm -hmm. right? Can you solve it in a better way? And AI is a new tool to solve the same problems, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, so I'm looking for companies, startups, people who are doing that, right? So just making a pitch to somebody, hey, we are a coolest, the coolest AI company and we have all these computer scientists working for us doesn't, doesn't really help. Mm -hmm. Right, so I think uh, Indian entrepreneurs, until they get to that point where they go out there and say, okay, this is a large problem, and maybe AI is the way to go solve this problem. So I'm waiting for that to happen. Himanshu, hey, would you kind of echo that similar sentiment in saying, you know, it's not about AI, but let's focus on the solution and then get and use the best technology to get there? Sure, yeah. So I think um, I would kind of a bit differ from where Herman is, and I think that. Um, so I would put it into context. You know, one is when you talk about entrepreneurship in AI, and then you talk about industry in AI in general. So, I'll, so uh, you know, I think a couple of things of how we think AI is set to <laughs> become big in India. One is I think the talent pool and talent pipeline is probably amongst the strongest in the world today. Mm -hmm. You know, in the top three for sure, if not in the top two. You know, so probably top three for sure. And um, uh, I think the other thing which I've seen is that if you look at traditional companies, you know, BPOs, for example, mm -hmm. I already see them starting to move from a paper person to a paper transaction mode. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that, you know, we would automate mm -hmm. and be able to do better decision making using AI and, and move from that, which India as a, you know, as a geography was losing mm -hmm. to other geographies because of the cost of talent going up. Mm -hmm. uh, these companies are not trying to claw back by saying that we will be able to do transactions which are AI driven. Um, I can give you a recent example of someone we were talking to whom we were helping hire AI scientists and they were like, they, they are into their large life sciences company and they're doing personalized diagnostics using AI. Mm -hmm. And it's a new product which they're coming out. So I think um, I can start, we can st start seeing penetration. I completely agree to the fact that we haven't seen a big problem yet being solved. Mm -hmm. But even if you like, a lot of times the Indian government is com considered very slow in things. Mm -hmm. We can already start seeing them making noise in data science and AI, which would, you know, typically they, you know, they miss the cloud, they miss the mobile, they would have missed this as well, but we can start seeing that. So I do think that there is better momentum in, around mm -hmm. that area. And, uh, and I completely agree with, uh, you know, the fact that there are certain problems on the infrastructure side and a lot of things which in India just can't get solved unless we have better application of AI. And, uh, and I think that's something which yeah. probably we should get to discuss. So I actually time. have, a, so here, uh, so I keep wondering, see, most of the call centers and uh, uh, even the KPO uh, industry in India is uh, basically serving the West, right. right? And I keep wondering if AI is the way to go, why wouldn't West develop AI-based solutions for the same thing and rather than outsourcing to India and Indian 
call centers developing products like these? I, I always wonder that. So yeah, no, I can I can add to that. I think um, 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 the companies which work for the West today, um, mm -hmm. you know, and hypothetically they are like working for the West here as well as there. Mm -hmm. If you look at them as pure play businesses, mm -hmm. they're competing in the in the world out mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So if we look at them as you know employment generation organizations mm -hmm. for the Indian economy, they're probably not going to be your mainstays forever. Mm -hmm. So how I look at AI and employment generation, which is something which, you know, that's the negative side of AI and machine learning, which has been talked about, is what industrialization did to the blue collar workforce, AI is going to do to the knowledge workforce. Mm -hmm. And that is kind of inevitable. Mm -hmm. That is going to happen. And that is why a lot of these initiatives of reskilling mm -hmm. and uh, getting people to do stuff which AI might not be very good at right. mm -hmm. doing. But I can tell you some, like, if you look at some of the pro local problems as well, uh, you know, so I was attending a presentation where there was someone was talking about there are about only 400 million native English speakers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are so many Indian languages mm -hmm. where you will need the same capability where we have 50 to 100 million native speakers of each of those languages, right. mm -hmm. much bigger than a lot of the languages out there. So just looking at the magnitude of problems, you know, mm -hmm. even if you were running a large governance project, mm -hmm. you know, you just can't solve it in India if you were to do it manually. There's just mm -hmm. no capacity. So. AI in those languages will fundamentally help you, you know, get where you are. And I don't think anyone else is going to invest money in doing. Right. That, I want to so. just dovetail off of that. Yeah. So maybe maybe we can we can talk about what why we think AI has not yet taken hold, and maybe we we agree with that or we don't agree with that thesis. So I think one thing that we would agree with is that we're still at a point in India's life where fundamental problems are being solved versus what I'll call applied stack problems, mm -hmm. right? So Google Home is a wonderful contribution to our mm -hmm. lives. Mm -hmm. um, that's relatively speaking a lesser priority in India, um, in India mm -hmm. right? There's more fundamental problems that be solved. So part of it's just prioritization, which makes yep. sense. Um, the second is um, not talent pool, because certainly we have an exceptional talent pool, and a talent pool that would be very well equipped to solving AI-based issues. But I would say that the principal issue is availability of large pools of data and hom homogeneity. And this is what I mean to say by that, is if you look at the markets where artificial intelligence has had the greatest contribution, say in the US, it's a relatively homogenous society from the standpoint of, of uh, English speaking and culture. Yep. And India arguably is the most diverse. Mm -hmm. you know? So you have you know, 100 plus regional and, and national languages. Mm -hmm. You have cultural distinctions between um, each of those, and then you have highly varying levels of access to the bandwidth and the computing power that you need to create these pools of data. Mm -hmm. So at the same token, that represents a substantive challenge to creating real, true AI and machine learning, because you need a relative level of homogeneity, a relative level of, of data, and those two things go together. Homogeneity means large pools of data that you can draw from, and that doesn't yet, yet exist. Yet, that's also the reason why AI would be so valuable in a market mm -hmm. like India. And when you do find the companies that solve that problem in, in India, they'll most likely be able to solve that problem in most any other scenario, mm -hmm. I would argue, you're geographically worldwide. So yeah. let's let's take a step back because a lot of interesting comments were just made. So with respect to Himanshu, your comment with aspiring minds, you know, you've reached four million candidates, you've done you know five hundred K job matches, you've been able to do it across 900 plus job roles. That is the impact of AI. And you've talked about how you know, manual evaluations are a thing of the past. They're going to become obsolete, and it's inevitable. Right. And so when we kind of think about this whole you know, man versus machine debate that we've seen, and this is in the US too, a lot of people fear that AI will take their jobs, and how will, and that's the need for you know, reskilling. And as investors, that those are some of the technologies we focus on, is making sure that the workforce is empowered and that they are prepared for that next leap in the job evolution. And so, Harman, I would love to ask you, you know, coming from WizIQ, how do you kind of see that man versus machine debate within mm -hmm. higher ed? Do you think that we will get to the point with AI where mm -hmm. students will no longer need that in-person tutor? And do you think technology will really help scale education to that level? Right. So, see, man versus machine debate is obviously, you know, one of the most amazing debates of the present age. And we all know what Elon Musk and the folks like that say about it. I think education is education as an industry is the final frontier for AI. Mm -hmm. It's not the first industry to transform with AI. It's actually the, I, in my view, it's actually the final industry that uh, will be uh, changed with AI. 
a lot more has to be done in AI before AI can really solve problems in education. Now, here's, here's the reason why. Because uh, education is all about creativity and solving new problems and stuff. And the AI that we have today is pattern recognition. It's as far away from real creativity, the, 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 uh, answering the question, why does something happen? Right? So uh, AI can do how, AI can do what, but AI is yet to figure out why. And, and education industry is all about that. Now having said that, I think for any technology, whether it's mobile, smartphones, internet in the 90s, or whenever, there are three, uh, uh, three things that really drive any adoption. Number one, it's the quality. Mm -hmm. Does the new technology improve quality by at least 10x? Number two, economics. Uh, does it make a serious dent in the economic dis uh, advantage over the previous generation? And number three is convenience. So if you, if you see any new technology, it fits the bill. Either high quality, uh, better economics, or really convenient. You, you plug in Amazon, you plug in uh, Uber, you plug in Facebook, anything you do, it, it has to fit in. Now in AI in education, if we apply to that, uh, is it more convenient for me to really uh, learn on the computer through an AI program than uh, a tutor coming into my home and doing mm -hmm. it? So uh, I don't know if that's going to happen. I don't see that happening for the next at least 10 years. Yeah. And, and when you kind of, Neil, I'd love to ask you this because, you know, Harman talks about the power of AI and it's still kind of limited by the fact that people would still need that personalized tutor. You're coming at it from an early childhood development perspective with Begin, where you know in-person interaction is crucial to that child's overall development and that child's overall socialization. How do you think of AI, and what do you think it can bring in terms of impact within you know early childhood development? And I would love for you to also talk about you know just broadly speaking within India today, where you see that. Sure. Um, so just to, to set a little bit of context, uh, as I mentioned, Begin. Uh, is focused on early learning and early childhood. We have, we have today two programs. Um, one is in pre-reading for children two to four years old, very young children, arguably some of their first exposure to screen time, and the purpose of that program is background knowledge, vocabulary, comprehension, unlocking intrinsic motivation. When they're four um, and above, they're focused on learning to read, and we have a second program uh, called Homer, which teaches them sequentially and systematically how to read. And that's really from four to six. So two to six is a sweet spot of how we focus on our user, which is a young child. So when we think about artificial intelligence within that context, um, double-edged sword, right? So part of the, our mission is if we're trying to build the best educational start, a level playing field for all children, then we cannot presume the quality of that child's classroom education. We cannot presume how involved the parent is. We're using technology as an equalizer. So there, artificial intelligence can play a very powerful role. Our adaptive and personalization engines are built off of artificial intelligence. We are experimenting with, which is tough for young children, uh, voice-based search. So a child can ask a question and be delivered content or stories um, because they may not be facile enough to navigate at two or three years old. Um, so artificial intelligence can deliver this promise of a personalized, adaptive um, system that compensates for a lack of teacher or parental involvement. But for us to argue as technologists that we want to um, eliminate the high-touch value of a parent-child interaction or teacher-child interaction would be foolish because one of the most important things that you can teach a child from two to six-year-old um, is ultimately socio-emotional learning and dialogic learning. Um, and you know, there's the, the state of artificial intelligence is not at the point and, and may not ever get to the point where it can replace sort of human connection. So again, how can we enable the experience for the child? How can we compensate for a lack of parental or, or teacher involvement, adult involvement, but how do we not ultimately even attempt to replace that? Um, how do we actually try to foster that by providing, in our case, parents and teachers insights and recommendations about how to better engage the child, connect the child and the, and the, and the adult experience versus sort of uh, fractionalizing that. And again, I think the analogy for that you know, with, with India is, is the application of artificial intelligence for the next X number of years a fundamental application of AI or a 
uh, application level of, of AI, um, and where does it sort of risk? Where will the biggest gains? And you know, my, my bet would be at a more fundamental level. Yeah, so my view is uh, that uh, you know, AI is gonna have its room in uh, education, but I always believe that the instructor or the teacher is gonna be at the center of education for, for many, many years to come. And uh, what AI could do is make the teacher more productive. That's right. Right? So that's how I see. It, a tutor in the, uh, at home is not going to be replaced by AI. But, for example, I, I know a couple of companies solving the problem of uh, grading papers. Mm -hmm. right? It takes a long time for any teacher to grade papers. So AI can help that. Uh, instant homework help, right? definitely AI can help in that. I know a couple of companies solving that problem. Uh, so the role of the instructor is definitely, definitely going to be better in the future. And it's going to be harder to become a teacher yeah. than it is today. Right? So, so that's what my view is, teacher in the, in the center and AI uh, making the teacher more productive. So, I mean, both of you have clearly echoed the fact that AI will help empower the educator, whether it's in early childhood development, whether it's in higher ed, but that the educator, if anything, will be more competent, will have to, you know, reskill themselves to make sure that they're able to Correct. adopt the AI technology. Himanshu, going back to you, you know, there is still a personal element of recruitment. And, you know, in the Valley today, we constantly are encountering, you know, talent acquisition solutions looking either to do top of funnel tasks, whether it's helping with sourcing and making those um, tasks more efficient and then empowering the recruiter to then focus and enable them to focus on more uh, personal aspects of the process, whether it's those in-person interviews. Do you think that AI is there, and you've kind of touched upon this, but right. would love your elaboration, to empower the recruiter or ultimately replace the recruiter? So I think I am. Um, uh, I think it's, um, it's, it's, I think one of the things which I'd like to add to, like the um, qualification which uh, Herman kind of laid out for why AI is useful. I think one which cuts across all of those is scale. Mm -hmm. I think scale and capacity <coughs> is where AI is going to be solving the first set of problems. Uh, and uh, that's where you know we have a lot of challenges in India. We have a lot of challenges in the Bay Area when you talk about recruiting, right? So um, if I was to you know provide a teaching assistant to every computer science student, yeah. there's no fundamental way in which I can do that with, yeah. uh, with the scale at which we have education. So I think the way you need to solve scale, and mm. certain humans will, so AI, you know, AI by definition is designed to mimic humans. Yep. Anyone who's trying to mimic someone cannot be as good or better than humans. Yep. All it can do is it can do it at scale and a standardized way. Yep. And that's where, you know, recommendation engines, diagnostics, where you need a lot of information to make decisions, and you need to do it at scale becomes very important. So for example, in the recruiting scenario where we face it, we have so many customers who uh, who would come up and say that it's not that we can't evaluate people manually, mm -hmm. but when we get 10,000 applicants because we ran a Facebook ad, mm -hmm. we will take a month to evaluate these people manually. Correct. With AI, I can do it in 20 minutes, yep. you know, assuming those, all those people show up for those 20 minutes of uh, you know, interaction with the AI tool. So I think that's where a real problem, that's where you know, the scale kind of drives yep. you to solve these problems, yep. which fundamentally, and I, I personally feel that's where India is gonna head to first in not going into you know, where we just don't have the capacity to solve certain problems. Right. We don't have the teachers in Correct. schools. You know, uh, we expect our kids to learn English, but they aren't teachers who can speak English. Their parents don't speak English. Probably they, in the first 10 years of their life, they hardly meet people who speak English unless they're watching TV. So how are you expecting them to learn mm -hmm. um, unless they have tools which are gonna do that? And I think that's where uh, you know, AI interventions may not be as perfect as Mm -hmm. what you know we can provide in a big city or in the west but that's where ai interventions would right. you know yeah in fact uh, fundamentally you mentioned yeah. the teaching assistant use case absolutely so my company in my company we are working on uh, ai to solve that problem mm -hmm. so and i believe that each teaching assistant is going to be each bot is going to be unique to the teacher mm -hmm. right uh, based on how and what and uh, when he or she teaches. So, so that is a problem we are focused on right now, uh, very early stage, 
but uh, you know that's one of my favorite topics in AI and education. Right. And so now let's transition over. I mean, I cannot be in a room with three entrepreneurs and coming from an investing background and not talk about you know the funding landscape in <laughs> India today. So between 2014 and 2017, AI startups in India raised less than 100 million from VCs. Furthermore, you know, angel and seed funding dropped 45% year over year as of March 2018, despite Indian capital being deployed in Series A rounds, and uh, you know, post those surging 73% year over year. So when you think about this, and happy for any of you to kind of take this question mm -hmm. first, how do you kind of think about the Indian-focused VC landscape today? So I'm talking about investors in India before we talk about global investors, and their effect on you know, India trying to make this leap in education technology, both within pre-K through 12 higher ed, and as we call it at GSV, that pre-K through grade spectrum, you know, pre-K through 12 higher ed, and then the enterprise. So yeah, I can you know, make a comment which might be, I think it's uh, dominantly lack of courage. I think Indian yep. investors, um, and I, I would say that for global investors looking at India as well, uh, mm -hmm. I don't think the courage to, and there might be valid reasons for it, I'm not saying, but the courage to invest aggressively in India to the, solve the scale and size of the problems we have mm -hmm. is just fundamentally missing. And it gets amplified in technology and AI, yeah. while you know for infrastructure we might still be still an attractive destination for scale investment, though that's also getting circumspect uh, over time. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I've raised a couple of rounds of investment. I think, uh, I think broadly speaking, it's uh, smaller bets, uh, smaller failure. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the theme of the most, most Indian investors. I shouldn't say all of them. Uh, but there's, uh, you know, the question is, why is that? Right? It's not like they, they don't want to make uh, big money. Of course they do. The challenge is, uh, I think, uh, it's at a macro level. Uh, if somebody were to invest in Indian, uh, in any Indian startup, right, anywhere in India, what options do, uh, does the person have? He can put the money in fixed deposit. Mm -hmm. He can put it in mutual funds. He can put it in real estate, right? Fixed deposit gives seven to eight percent return. Right, mutual funds on an average would give a 15 to 20 percent return, and real estate would do the same. Right now, the uh, so they are the least risky of the bets. You just park your money and just forget about it. Mm -hmm. Now comes innovation. Right, who's going to put money in innovation? Which is why, uh, so far, all the investments that have gone in India have been in Me Too companies. Right in '97, from the monster of India, right. Uh, then the Amazon of India, the Uber of India, you know, the Yelp of India. All these, by the way, are billion dollar companies each, right? So this is a challenge I've seen in the last 10 years ever since I've been in this industry. Uh, and I've always wondered why, till I, you know, till I found this answer, and, and it does answer. So uh, now having said that, the next 10 years in India are different. Mm -hmm. You want to put money in real estate today, you're not going to make any money. Right. Right, you did that ten years ago. So uh, plus reliance with this whole, all these data plans. My internet, my in internet in New Delhi, is four times faster than the internet here, uh, staying in an Airbnb place. Right, four times faster, and the price is one fourth. Now that's going to change that economy. Right, I think what China was seven to eight years ago, uh, India is there. Right? And, and some of the largest yet to build consumer internet brands in India are going to start today. It's interesting you mentioned China because, I mean, you think about the success of VIP Kit, for instance, and what that's yeah. done to the sector. Yeah. How would you compare and contrast the Indian investor today to the Chinese investor, considering that a lot of Indian entrepreneurs and a lot of Indian venture capitalists are looking to kind of emulate, um, or actually do emulate the Chinese model today, mm -hmm. more so than even the US to a mm -hmm. certain extent. Correct. So we'd love Correct. both of your thoughts on that. Yeah. So uh, in my view, we as an economy are much closer to China uh, mm -hmm. and even the consumer behavior or the way the families are set up. I think, I don't know why, but it could be the East thing. Uh, you know, education, for example, test prep education and the skilling market in India is much bigger than in the US, mm -hmm. uh, right? And uh, see, the government pays here. In India, there's no government to pay for these things. Yes, they pay for higher education, even K-12 now, uh, but 
the families are on their own. So, and they know as a fact that uh, unless their kids are educated, they're not gonna make, uh, make it in life. So, so, so China is very similar, mm -hmm. right? There are no <coughs> social securities. So there's, a, so there's always this, uh, you know, uh, so, so, so they're very similar that way. So I also believe that um, India is gonna follow the more China model than the, we have way different. I've lived in the States for seven or eight years. I, I see there's so much of cultural difference. Mm -hmm. You know, there's so many things that don't make sense here, but they do over there, right? I've seen kids uh, drop out of high school just to, uh, just to pass a certain exam so they can get into college. Mm -hmm. Drop out of high school to do that. They stay at home, they just study, they have tutors, you know, and then they move into a really good college, mm -hmm. right? And then they come to the U.S. and all that. That's yeah. interesting. I think, so, yeah, uh, yeah. So I, I think I kind of agree to Herman, and what I think one of the key differences is when you look at ed tech versus the other sectors. Mm -hmm. So ed tech businesses typically have longer gestations, right. you know, and no offense to any of the MOOCs which came up here, but we can see how they're still trying to get their footings on how the outcomes are going to get measured. And when you have longer gestation businesses, you need a lot of braver heart to invest in them. And right. I think we saw that in China. China, I think fundamentally, when you look at VIP Kids or TAL and so on, they're like multi-billion dollar companies. Fundamentally, the bet was taken that English education is, mm -hmm. is very important for this <coughs> a billion and a half people, mm -hmm. and technology is the only way it's gonna solve it. I don't think these companies were looking at like high top lines and bottom lines, and they were competing with global majors like Pearson mm -hmm. in the market. So the bets, I think fundamental bets in EdTech have not been taken in India. Right. To some extent, it's also because of the government control on how education needs to be done in India, mm -hmm. and the for-profit, not-for-profit debate which goes on there, and the government spending which is never gonna come to any of these plays, which is the largest spending in education in India by far, uh, apart from individuals paying for it. So I think uh, longer gestation businesses, um, if we take fundamental bets that these problems need to be solved, mm -hmm. for, I'll give you another example, which is very classic, the Indian IT industry. Mm -hmm. It's huge, right? It's, it's probably the world's envy when it comes to you know, a few million people working in IT and you know, servicing global customers. We don't have a single large IT training company in the country. Hmm. Who could say that we have 5,000 crores of revenue or like a billion dollars of revenue in IT training? And why is that? Because no one is fundamentally taking a bet on investing in technology, scale, yep. and innovation to penetrate yep. that market yep. and make it big. And hence, we have like a lot of small companies yep. who are doing all the different stuff, yep. but that's why you're not seeing scale. And that's kind of, you know, probably f the feedback goes back into the market to investors as well that there yep. aren't going to be companies who are going to be at scale. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and Neil, I would love to ask you, I mean, obviously you've had experience raising capital both from Indian VCs and US-based or global VCs, I should say. Can you kind of compare and contrast those two experiences? And then to what Himanshu said, a lot of AI startups face that issue of initially it's just about getting the data, so you can't monetize as quickly. And if there's that general consensus that Indian investors may be less courageous, and as a result may need to have returns sooner rather than later, do they have the patience to invest and in the timeline required for an AI company to truly realize its gains and become profitable? Well, look, I think, I think India suffers from the classic VC dilemma, which I think is problematic in the US as well, which is the chicken and the egg problem which is the reason that EdTech as a whole is so deeply underfunded relative to its, say, GDP contribution mm -hmm. or societal contribution <laughs> is because you want to see the exits and the liquidity paths to command that capital, mm. and yet you're not going to see the exits and liquidity paths unless you have that capital. And that's just exacerbated in markets like, like India um, because there's even less of uh, maybe a compulsion, in essence, to be able to put that capital to work. Yep. And the best example of that is that, as I mentioned, um, we sold our Savin music business um, you know, a few weeks ago to Reliance. It was a billion dollar transaction. We built the largest music streaming service in India from New York, mm -hmm. right, with US capital mm -hmm. in India, which is insane, if you ask me, right? That's not to say that we didn't have a large Mumbai office. We had ad sales uh, in Delhi. But we knew that if we were going to build a consumer subscription business, which typically requires tens of millions of dollars of capital, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of capital, if you look at Spotify and, 
and Netflix and Hulu and the like, that we would need to have um, a, a home base in a market like New York or in a market like the Valley to be able to attract that. And lo and behold, largest investor in that deal was Tiger Global, which New York-centered venture hedge fund model that had made very, very large bets in India. Mm -hmm. um, now, what I, what I do believe is um, a couple of things are going to change, right? So I think to Harman's point, um, you, we have to get the foundations right. You have to create the proper environment for there to be liftoff in the market. So mm -hmm. what you're starting to see now is smartphone penetration obviously has tipped into yep. being truly a mass market. Broadband penetration is now following that same path and costs are, are plummeting. Um, you're seeing uh, a movement towards deregulation in the market and government, uh, government support. And you're starting now to see the success stories coming out of India in tech where there are unicorn level exits. That, those are the ingredients mm -hmm. where now, similar to where yep. China was a few years ago, yep. those are the perfect ingredients for you to have, start taking or creating runaway success. Yep. And then more capital will flow into that marketplace. Yep. So to some degree, it's understandable why uh, Indian investors were skittish. Um, they were sort of following the, the trend lines of the foundations of the economy. We've arrived. You know, India tends to be uh, late, but better late than never. Uh, and hopefully we'll play a little bit of, of catch up. And I think that's what, what's cause for optimism. Yeah. So uh, absolutely. So five or six years ago, nobody had heard of a private company that's valued at a billion dollars right. in India. And now there's so many, right? right? Uh, so that definitely is going to help. And, uh, uh, you know, so as I said, this is, this is the time to make investments in India. And one beautiful thing, uh, having traveled in different countries, uh, the, there's only, uh, there's one commonality between the U.S. and India. In the U.S., you know, uh, people don't look out, outside of U.S. Mm -hmm. For them, the whole universe is here, right? It's U.S. everywhere. And in New York, people don't look out of New York, right? <laughs> uh, India, to me, is the only other country, maybe China, I uh, don't know much about it. India is the only other country, in my view, that has a similar viewpoint, right. that everything is here in India. So, which goes to show they're not dependent on ex exports, right? right? Uh, so they want everything inside, the buyers, the sellers, the visions that are formed, they're all India-centric. So I think that's going to be a great, uh, in, a great ingredient to build really large companies from inside India. And so now kind of let's look at it from the entrepreneur's perspective. So you, you kind of joked about this. You know, in New York, you don't look outside New York. In the U.S., in the Valley, you don't look outside the Valley or the U.S. But for that entrepreneur, that's building that business in New York, wanting to expand to India. And then for that entrepreneur in India, what advice do you have, regardless of their geographic location, on how to succeed as an entrepreneur looking to cater to the Indian market today? And it, it can be broad advice. It doesn't necessarily have to be you know, sector focused, whether it's pre-K through 12 higher ed or the enterprise. But what are some you know, pieces of advice you can give entrepreneurs wanting to cater to the Indian market? Oh, you mean uh, uh, can businesses be built sitting here that cater to right, the Right, because you have, you have equal amount of businesses in the U.S. looking to expand right. globally to India, and you have right. an equal number of businesses in India you know, looking to cater to India and then potentially yeah. expand globally yeah. thereafter. Yeah. Yeah. Neil? Um, look, I think that India has one significant competitive advantage relative to most other countries in, in, in the world, growing economies, which is English. Mm -hmm. right? So uh, that is a massive competitive advantage when you're dealing with your counterparts uh, in India, which for many of us that are looking to expand into China becomes a huge issue and creates a dependency challenge in terms of having either Mandarin speakers in your company or people on the ground ultimately as well. So that's one great advantage um, that we have from a cultural perspective being able to transact in India. But I think like, aside from that, that the lessons are the lessons of expanding into any international market, which is that mm -hmm. you have to dedicate yourself to that market. It's hard to be an aircraft carrier that is sort of landing off of the coast of that country. Mm -hmm. um, and ideally, you may want to consider whether you partner or do it yourself, right? So, um, you know, we, we acquired a company early on in our life that gave us a nice foothold in India. We built an office in India as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and that helped us to both retain a base in New York capitalization from the states, but have critical local presence in the Indian market by which to execute. 
Um, I think some companies will have success, effectively large enough size and resourcing to be able to operate uh, independently in India. It's not difficult to start an independent business in India. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no uh, restrictions with regards yep. to ownership. Yep. Um, others will want to choose uh, partners. So for example, in our EdTech business, despite our deep knowledge of the Indian marketplace, our entry point in early learning in India is by, by virtue of a partnership with a large education publisher in that market. Mm. Uh, it just does not make sense for us to set up a, a, a fundamental um, uh, foundation in the office there until we have some proof of success. But luckily we can do that and it's very easy to transact uh, with them as well. So again, I think you know, it's, it's easier than you think and harder than you, than you believe until you actually do it. Um, but I think to, to the, each of our points, um, if you look at the inevitable trajectory of the Indian marketplace and you draw an analogy of China, which I think is a very appropriate analogy, we're within a five year window where things are gonna really take off. And that means now is the time ultimately to invest in the market or to create businesses serving that market. Yep. Yep. No. Manchu, do yeah. you agree with what Neil just I think, just I, think said? I agree with uh, you know, uh, both of them. And I, I would just add that I think, um, and I think this has been said as well, but I'll just add that I think you need to have a, a, a you know, not a local flavor, mm -hmm. but an uh, but, um, India-centric thought process to be able to do it. So if you think that you're going to you know, mm. paint it in the right colors to sell it, it's going to be a much harder. It's a m much deeper market than people realize. Right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's going to, you know, at the outside, it might not look as challenging as nowadays. I'll give you a simple example. You know, I'm sure you guys would have faced it. How many sources of pirated content you could get in India, which fundamentally take away, you know, a big chunk of your market right. because people are not ready to pay for it or use it basis the way it's going. So I think uh, one needs to uh, get a deeper into the market to understand what's going to work. And uh, you know, and I, I do think that a lot of products need that, um, you know, uh, going beyond localization, going beyond okay, a better word, going beyond translation to get to uh, get to the markets you're trying to achieve. So I think. So I have a couple of observations uh, in my experience. Number one, uh, we are B two B selling a software company, and a big chunk of our revenue comes from the U S. and a majority of our revenue comes from the West. Mm -hmm. while we have uh, not a single person employed here in the US, they're all in India. So we sell over the phone. Uh, at the same time, we try to sell the same product, even at lower prices in India, it doesn't work. Uh, so, what I, so, so advice to entrepreneurs is that if you are in the B2B business mm -hmm. from India, uh, do not try to sell in India. The West is your market. There's, Zoho has become a billion dollar company doing that. Fresh Desk is another unicorn. However, if you're doing a consumer business, mm -hmm. India is a supermarket. Mm -hmm. It's a great market for somebody to build a unicorn in the consumer business, mm -hmm. right? Uh, another one is that, you know, until, uh, see, there's, there's an important observation here. There's no Facebook of India. There's a Facebook of China. There's no Twitter of India. Uh, there's no Skype of India. There's no LinkedIn of India. You know why that's the case? Because these products, are 100% virtual products. They do not need any localization beyond mm -hmm. the language, right? However, there is an Amazon of India, mm -hmm. or a Yelp of India, or an Uber of India. And the reason behind that is, there is some local vendors behind the scene powering those companies, mm -hmm. right? So in fact, people tried to build Facebook of India by Reliance. Uh, there's a Nokri a company tried to yeah. build the LinkedIn of India. Mm -hmm. They failed miserably. So I think these uh, couple of observations I've had over the years. Uh, so if I were to start a new business in this area, these are the things I'll keep in mind. And it's interesting that you said that because a lot of the Me Too companies have failed primarily because they have not understood the Indian consumer and have assumed that the Indian consumer would act and behave in the same way that the US or the Chinese consumer would. And that's not always the case. I guess when you guys, you know, with roughly five minutes left, uh, I could be talking to all three of you all day, but just to kind of end this, where do you kind of see the next five to 10 years when it comes specifically to, you know, the use of AI, the use of ML, the use of other advanced technologies within the Indian learning and talent technology space? I think it's, it's set to blow out of the roof, in my opinion. And I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to solve problems which we don't expect to be solved in the West with AI, and like, like we talked about bandwidth and so on. So it's going to be addressed to problems which are 
um, you know, lack of infrastructure, both soft and hard. Um, so uh, in my opinion, it's, it's set to poise to uh, uh, become really big. And a lot of the fundamental changes which are happening, as we all talked about, are going to enable that uh, phenomenally well over the next five to 10 years. Yeah. So I would stick to what I said. I think uh, teaching assistant use case uh, with AI is going to be a key use case in India. Uh, so keeping the role of the educator or the instructor right there. Uh, but uh, average instructors are not going to have a room in India because they're not paid by the government. Mm -hmm. They are work for private companies. And, uh, you know, there's no safe haven for that. Um, we always say that necessity is the mother of invention. And so you look at India and all the necessities of that market, right? You have, as we talked about, a highly diverse population um, that ultimately is um, challenging for AI. You have um, a population ultimately that um, has much need for scale because the, the people problem cannot solve the one-to-one -one relationship. Um, and you have an education environment where it's hyper-competitive ultimately to be able to get into the most elite of schools. Perfect necessity that would make AI uh, a great solution. And now, I think finally, you're seeing a tipping point in terms of the environment that you need, the ingredients you need for success. Again, with bandwidth, smartphone usage, um, access to uh, the hardware, and ultimately um, the government support as well. So now is the time to invest, and I will say that the companies that solve the AI challenges of India, given their significant constraints, will be among the leaders of AI around the world because they will have done it in one of the most difficult markets and one of the most difficult populations from a standpoint of data. And I think that's very exciting. Yeah. Well, I think it's clear that the Indian market's, you know, ripe for disruption today and that, as you mentioned, the time is now both to invest and both to start the solutions and to focus more on the solutions as opposed to the technology itself, as you had mentioned previously. Can't thank you enough, all three of you, for your time today. And I hope all of you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you.